Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby, Season 3. Well, according to my playlist, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Can I just say, though, terms and conditions apply. Not if you live in the UK, not if you play for the Exeter Chiefs and are trying to defend your European title, not if you play for Glasgow Warriors and met Exeter Chiefs in Round 1, not if you play for Bath and met the Scarlets, and not if you're the Scarlets or actually... It's quite good if you're the Scarlet because you can get COVID and a bonus point win over too long, but we'll get on to that later. Um, Adam, apart from a few hours on Sunday when uh, Quinns met Racing 92, are you in a jolly festive mood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, uh, I watched Elf last night and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm you know fully embracing Christmas now. Yeah, it's been it was a yeah, tough one Sunday, but uh, yeah, just got to get, gotta get on with it. You know, got to get on with it like, like life at the moment. Sean... <laughs> From zero to ten, how festive are you feeling? <laughs> I'm not feeling very festive, that's for sure, with this uh, lockdown. This is going to be a great program. People are loving uh, it already. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. Um, it's not uh, the time of year to be. Um, I suppose to be very happy the way things are, but it is what it is, and we need to embrace it. So, um, the one good thing is we have um, uh, uh, a fake Santa Claus on the screen tonight with Adam and. Uh, He's he's, good, cheer, he's, 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 he's cheered me up a little bit already. Oh, I'm glad I can help you, but I'm glad I can help you. Um, what is it like to be a professional rugby player or indeed coach Adam at this time of year? Because you all have matches on Boxing Day, St Stephen's Day for you, Sean. Um, you know, how restricted are you? It's probably the norm for us at the minute because as players anyway, um, we're so used to Christmas is coming and going. We don't really get to um, unwind or sw- we switch off on Christmas Day. Um, I've always, when I've been at home, I've always remembered going for the turkey. You'd go easy on the dessert and uh, you'd, you'd get onto the couch for two or three hours, Kip. That's the only good thing about Christmas Day is you'd actually be uh, properly rested for uh, the game on Stevens' Day at home. This year, it'll be just me and Zeus uh, for, for Christmas dinner, unfortunately. Um, for but, people who um, don't know, that is your dog. That is my dog, yes. It's probably good to make it's not, that clear. It's not my son or uh, boyfriend or anything like that. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's it's definitely going to be different this year. Adam, from as a coach, you can just do what you want, can't you? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So it's, you know, spent, 50, well, 10, 15 years, you know, used to enjoy Christmas. Uh, you know, obviously we never train, um, train Christmas Eve after Christmas Day. And then we usually put 60, 70 points on the Scarlets every Boxing Day. So it was, it was always a good, uh, it was always a good tradition with us. And, but no, it's, um, it's, a, it's a strange time, isn't it? But it's, uh, you know, it's something to look forward to with the boys. It's, uh, you know, so everyone can watch the games on TV. So, you know, there's no fans, but, you know, the boys, uh, you, rugby players, you get used to it. It's, it's nothing new, really. So, um, you know, I don't think many teams train on Christmas Day anymore. But, um, yeah, look, it's, it is what it is. It's just, as I said, as a coach, you're going to probably, indulge a little bit more on Christmas Day with the food. Uh, before we look forward, um, let's just take a look back. Adam, I'm sorry to have to sort of bring it up. It was a tough Sunday for you against Racing 92, wasn't it? Yes. That's the polite way. It, it, it was. It, it was. They, they're obviously a very good team. Um, yeah, you know, they're one of the best sort of top five teams in Europe, or top three teams in Europe, aren't they? So, and uh, yeah, look, we wouldn't thought we played to our best, uh, or to our potential, but, uh, and they didn't allow us to. So, you know, there's a, yeah, as I said, there's a reason they're so good. They got some unbelievable players. Um, they were missing shot, but, you know, so you see when you got like Zebo, when you got, you know, Curtly Beal, these type of dudes, it's, uh, you know, it's going to be a tough day and, you know, big four park as per most French teams. And yeah, they, yeah, look, they've, um, they, uh, it is what it is. And, uh, they won handsomely, and uh, we just got to pick ourselves up and look forward to Bristol. So it's not much more we could do, really. And Sean, London Irish are doing well. They've got the added bonus of you turning up to play for them this weekend as well. Yeah, we've had two good, um, two good results against two uh, big French teams. Um, the first day was a bit of a an easy one for them, but last weekend was a bit of an arm wrestle. They were massive, uh, massive pack last weekend, and uh, the boys played some nice rugby. Um, and we've been improving. We've been improving every week, which has been. Um, you know, a good thing, and um, you know, really looking forward to this weekend. Now, big challenge against Bath, and we have a few lads back, so we've um, we'll have a strong uh, contingent heading that way on um, Stevens' day or Boxing Day as it's known here. But yeah, it's been uh, it's been good and excited now to get back this week, and not really too worried about Christmas. More worried about getting the 
getting the win at the weekend, hopefully. So we've got plenty coming up for you on House of Rugby tonight from our end of year awards. Nolly Waterman drops in to talk about mental health and the transition from player to media and player to coach. And also we'll hear from Alex Good from Japan. But first of all, let's just take a look back at the weekend because four matches were cancelled in the Heineken Champions Cup. Exeter Chiefs were affected, Glasgow were affected, Bath and the Scarlets. Uh, Jonathan Davis, it was a very odd one with the Scarlets. Uh, great to have you with us because there's lots to clear up. Um, so tell us how where it started. You guys had a great win over Bath, but then had a positive COVID test. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So one of the boys uh, came back, tested positive, and then obviously he was taken away from training and the close contacts were... Uh, told to isolate for 10 days. So changes were made to the team and the team was named um, and all protocols were done by and the game was cleared by the EPCR then. So um, we made changes, we adapted and yeah, then there's me driving in on Friday afternoon, getting ready to play um, Toulon and then changed quite suddenly then. But Toulon had spoken to the EPCR a couple of times in the week, hadn't they? They would they were concerned about the safety. They flew over. They did their captain's run on the Friday morning and it was still on at that point. Yeah, so Friday morning they come to the ground. They do, I think, a walkthrough. And then next thing you know, we're starting to get whispers as we're driving down um, from the other boys who, um, who have, the injured boys who have been training in the day. And the, the first that Scarlett's heard about it was the bus driver told the security guard at the ground that he was driving too long back to the airport. So no official announcement was made. So um, we were just, we weren't aware what was going on then. So we were still driving to the game until it was, you know, told it was called off or not. So there was, a, I think there was a lot of confusion around it all. But yeah, it was just so strange. Um, don't know what, it's like, you know, I've seen a lot in rugby, but that was probably the weirdest thing, heading to a game and, probably passed the Toulon bus as they were going to the, the Cardiff airport. What, why did he even bother coming over then? I, like, I did, it, did, what was the What was their thought process, I wonder? I don't know. They they said, I think, their concerns about the one positive case um, and the close contacts. and um, Yeah, I, I don't know, Shawnee Boy. It was so weird because everything was cleared. Um, Public Health Wales were happy with what we'd done. Um, the EPCR cleared it. So... It, it wasn't, it was just so weird. I don't know what to say on it, really. Like, we, we were gutted. Do you reckon they were, they, it was a plan? I think it if was. They, if, if they show up and, like, um, you know, show face and get there, and, oh, all right, and then they, it was always going to happen. And they get, the, they get the points now, I guess, they? No, we got the points. We got five points. Oh, you got the points? Yeah, because they, we... But there's even more points as I'm coming over then. I know, I know. That that was the strange thing. Like, they just, they wasted probably, I don't know how much in charge of flights coming over here, hotels and everything, and they just don't bother playing, you know. It's, I, don't know if, I don't know if that's their biggest worry, is it, their, their owner? <laughs> I know with their, with their salary bill, it's probably not, not the biggest <laughs> concern, but... <laughs> it wouldn't be a ripple in, um, in their owner's bank account, I'd say, no, you wouldn't see it. <laughs> yeah. no, he's not too bothered. That doesn't make any sense. That's strange. It was strange in the first place, I suppose, if you were looking in at it, that um, that Bath were, was cancelled and then the Scarlets were still going ahead. Because even on the Saturday, you guys were down as postponed. You were never straight, straight away cancelled because I think you were all offered an extra round of testing or something to try and appease too long. Yeah, and that was, I think, the, the most frustrating part because the... EPCR, all public health, um, were happy with what we've done, our test results. Um, but then Toulon were almost like they were, weren't happy with what was done and saying that things were different, done different back in France. And we got frustrated the fact that they were offered a, a Sunday fixture where we turned up to play when everything was cleared. And clubs shouldn't really dictate what happens, you know, and it, it felt like that was trying to be done here and you know it was it was unfortunate because the boys were looking forward to like you know a, a tough game it's just so strange it's unfortunate really that it's, it, it came to that but Sean it's also unfortunate for a side like Bath or a side like Glasgow who because they ended up in close contact with a team like Exeter that had 17 positive tests they then are on the wrong side of a bonus point victory aren't they yeah it's 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 not done probably um 
I don't think it's that fair actually the way the Champions Cups uh, is done. Um, to be fair, I know Foxy, you'll be happy with your five points, but I think I think Prem has um, a little bit of a better understanding of it. Of if if um, the side who who's tested positive for the case gets rewarded two points, and the and the other team gets rewarded four points, it's not as if it's a it's done on purpose or there's um, you know in this pandemic anything can happen. But it is very unfortunate. But yeah, for Bat and for all their players and um, everyone else involved, having to isolate for 10 days isn't ideal either. And it's not a good part of your training program when they have to come out of um, isolation probably today or tomorrow, I think today maybe. And then they have a couple of days to prepare for another big game in the Prem. So it affects everybody. Luckily, it's against you guys. Yeah, luckily it's against us. And, uh, <laughs> it's a nice easy one. Yeah, yeah we're not. Uh, we're not. Um, we're we're preparing as if um, you know they're at they're at full whack. But um, I'm sure to be well up for it anyway. But it is it is uh, frustrating for clubs um, who do um, you know come out with the, the wrong end of the wrong end of it and and uh, they suffer. And the Champions Cup, it's pretty ruthless there at the minute compared to um, you know again what the Prem is going to do. It also affects um, other uh, leagues as well because in Pro 14, the Edinburgh match is off because Glasgow can't play that one because they don't have the players to do it. So it's the knock-on effect. Um, Adam, do you think it's going to end up affecting the credibility of the competition? Oh, it'll have a big asterisk next to it, I think, wouldn't it? Oh, look, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, it is tough. So I think you have to kind of take everything with a little bit, not, not a pinch of salt, but, you know, everything's been affected. The whole, you know, so you've got to, as long as long as there's rugby in the field and the you know there's games going on, there'll be a big asterisk next to it. And you know, it's just it's just gonna be one you look and look and look back in years to come saying that was the COVID year and it's you know, you know, the Scarlets might win it and they haven't even you know, they they didn't even beat Toulon. So, you know, they got a bonus point win. So which would pain me to see. But um <laughs> no, it's it's always it's it's a tough one, isn't it? So, um no don't wanna be too but you know, as long as everyone is healthy and then you know and everyone's looked after properly, then, you know, it's all you can ask for. Are we going to spoil your Christmas bomb when we beat the Ospreys on Boxing Day, do you reckon? I, I don't think I ever lost the Scarlet on Boxing Day. Are you I sure? Well, I, I didn't win many, i got to say. No, you you definitely didn't win many against us. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Jonathan, what do players think of it all, though? I mean, what at the moment is the sort of feeling that every time you head into a game you could be ended up locked in your house through no fault of your own. Yeah, it's difficult. It's like, you know, we get tested every week and you're the, the next day you're just looking at your phone to see how many, if there are any positive results because you're just like, right, we're naming the team for the week. But as you know, as last week happened, changes happen and, and you know, it's, it's you're just on, not on tenterhooks, but you're just aware of how... Things might have to change. You have to adapt, you know, and, you know, overcome it all. And I think, um, you know, I was driving down to the game on Friday. Um, I got a phone call off Ken Owens. He says, um, too long and bugging off. And um, the game's been cancelled. And then we could be, we go out on the field and we try and do a training session. We get to doing a fitness session. Halfway through, the coach is running on the field. Oh, we could be playing Sunday now. So we're all like, ah, oh, come on, someone make a decision here. So it, it just seems that, you know, they're trying to make sure that everything's in place, but you know, I don't think anyone's planned for this uh, this pandemic. I was I was just going to say it like he he Ken Owens will be the future president of the WRU without without a shadow of a doubt. He's a board member. Years, he's a years. board member. He's completed rugby. He's a board member of the Scarlets. You know, he's the chairman of um, Welsh rugby now. You know, he, he loves it. He's the best politician I've ever seen going around um, <laughs> in a function in a function room after the game, even with Irish and English. He's he's, he's he lobbying knows all hard. Our songs. <laughs> yeah. He knows all their songs. He knows every president and Alakadu go. <laughs> he knows all the suits. Yeah. He, he's yeah. got his finger on the pulse, let's put it that way. Yeah. He's well able to work a room, so he is. And he's a good singer. Every Welshman is. Right, hold on, Foxy. You haven't, a, you haven't a tune in your head, so you haven't. So, Foxy, you're playing Boxing Day as well. We were just speaking to the guys at the beginning there about their plans. Uh, what's your Christmas Day like? So we made a decision as a family to stay away from each other this year. So um, I managed. we did that last week before the announcement. So managed to get my turkey uh, booked in. So Christmas Day in the house um, with the wife and the dog and then go down. I think we're playing. It's meant to be Osprey's home game, but we're playing in Parker Scarlet's, which is another... Uh, 
strange thing going on. It's it's just a crazy year. So go go down, beat the Ospreys, and then um, kick back and enjoy yeah. a few beers on Boxing Day. Yeah? So about to be Adam has left the conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they always they always talk a good game, don't they? To be fair, that's <laughs> that's actually true, Adam. I agree with you. Agree oh, good one, Jonathan. It's probably time for you to go. You don't need this, do you? You don't need this hassle. You only dropped in to no, have yeah, a nice chat. I only came in to say hello, so I'll leave you to it, guys. Thanks very much. Cheers, we'll thank see you, you soon. Have a lovely Christmas. Cheers, see you, Foxy. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks very much, John. Um, Adam, this was always going to be an odd Champions Cup anyway with the pools and the restructuring that they've done to try and fit everything into the rugby calendar. You could be in a situation or a team could be in a situation where they win all their pool matches and still don't even make it through to the quarterfinals. Such is the life, isn't it, at the moment? It's, everything's a bit weird. Everything's a bit strange. You know, I think a lot of teams have known you have to win four games to go in. But as you said, that might not even happen. So to throw in the COVID and to throw in the other ramifications around that, then it's it's, it's it's a strange one. And you do feel for, you know, I speak from our club, I'm pretty sure everyone does the right stuff around COVID. No one's, you know, no one's purposely going out to catch it and pass it around the team. You know, so you say 17 from Exeter, you know, they wouldn't have, you know, they, they'd be more heartbroken than anyone, you know, not being able to... Um, defend their title, you know, but at least, you know, playing every game and trying to defend it that way. So, you know, everyone everyone does, you know, everything to the T. So it's just one of these unbelievably strange, weird situations we find ourselves in. And it's yeah, it, it's it's tough, you know, it's like we got Munster in our group. If they, they, they miss a bonus point against us, you know, if they get to, they potentially might not go through even if they win the next two games. So hopefully they don't beat us again. But you know, it's uh, it, it it's tough. But you know, as I said, it's very much Massive asterisks next to it, you know, everyone understands in the world what's going on. So you've just got to just get on with it and just see see how it just how the cards for fall at the end of the season. Yeah, absolutely. Well, earlier on, uh, Sean, you were late back from training, so you didn't take part in this. But Adam and I were able to sit down and have a chat with Nolly Waterman to talk all things about the transition from being a player to in the media or a player to a coach. In Adam's case, I started off by asking how she's going to get through her tier four Christmas. You're watching the House of Rugby on Joe. Well, I'm delighted that for this section, this conversation, we have a great friend of mine. She was a huge part of the history of the Red Roses. Uh, World Cup winner, starred in World Rugby's Team of the Decade. It's Danielle Nolly Waterman. Nolly, great to have you along uh, with Adam and myself for this chat. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Um, obviously enjoyed a quick trip to Dublin with you recently um, for Lent to Northampton, which actually was a far better game than probably anyone gave credit to beforehand. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm trying to trying to wrap up everything that I've been busy with so that I can actually shut my laptop and uh, step away from set some technology for the next few days. You're having a tier four Christmas, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm, unfortunately, I was so desperate to get out of London and to get back to the West Country um, to see my family. But unfortunately, that's not um, going to be the case, uh, thanks to our new rules. Um, but I know we're all kind of trapped in our respective countries, etc. I think you more than anyone, Lee. No one in and no one out, I think, at the, the moment. hostage situation. <laughs> So what we're going to talk about here is the transition from being a player to either a broadcaster or a coach. I know you've had many hats, Nolly. Adam, you went from playing to coaching. Um, Nolly, we'll start with you. Just tell us about how easy, how difficult that transition was. When you decide to hang up those boots and look for a different career, how tough was that? I think from, from my perspective as a female player, probably one of the things that was easier was that transition than maybe Adam and the boys would have felt because for 12 of my 15 years as an international I actually worked uh, full time so I had been in the big wide world probably not properly as an adult but I had been there and I'd experienced it and um, during my time as uh, through my career I, I primarily focused around um, education and coaching and mentoring and it's something that I'm really passionate about still now. Um, helping younger players um, and just young people in general. Um, but the other side of it was the media. And I spent a reasonable amount of time on, this, on the sidelines, unfortunately. And so I just thought, you know what, you're given these amazing opportunities to chuck your hat in the ring and, and go and sit next to Alex Payne in the studio and hear what talk back is and all of these crazy things that you media people make look very easy. Um, and I don't know, it, it, 
it was never going to replace rugby, but at the same time, the thrill and the nerves that I get pre commentating, um, I genuinely can only describe them as test match nerves. Like there's nothing else that have, has managed to even get close to that. It's been a good journey. Um, you kind of chucked in at the deep end and, and Adam, you'll be able to relate to this, that you leave a place where you're an expert, especially when you've played right at the top, you know, you're a test level rugby player and you're respected not only amongst your peers, but within the media and with um, the public with what you've achieved. And then all of a sudden it's like, you're supposedly the same person in your new role. And that just isn't the case because as much as you can take a lot of your experience and knowledge, it is a whole different ball game when you're having to say something in a succinct way that's interesting, that's factual. Um, you're not stumbling over your words in front of millions of people. You know, it's a, it's quite a challenge. And I'm sure, Adam, you can appreciate that as you've stepped across into coaching because it's tough, right? <laughs> I didn't realize how hard it would be like to the coaching job. Like I think I've been one of the lucky ones, but as a player, you kind of just... Uh, you look at you look you look after yourself. You look after your body. You do a bit of analysis, and um, you know that's pretty much it. Don't play the game on the Saturday, <laughs> but coaching is it's a oh, massive eye opener to me. It's been um, you know I've enjoy, I've, I'm enjoying it. It's a much more difficult job than actually playing for me. But uh, look, it's I could have well I would I wouldn't have worked it down a mine like my grandfather because the mines were shut. But you know there's a lot worse job and what lot harder jobs out there. So uh, you know I'm pretty lucky to be in this one anyway. From what you've learned from your coaching, Adam, do you think back to when you were playing thinking, oh, I should have been a little bit nicer to those coaches or were you always pretty good? Yeah, I was all right. I was, yeah, I was pretty <laughs> good. They, they didn't yeah, they didn't like me for some reason, mainly my, uh, <laughs> mainly for my diet, mainly. But um, that was, a, you know, it was always a, a topic conversation. But no, it's, it's yeah, it's the man management things uh, was, was a bit new to me. And uh, certainly within, the, um, you know, how can I say this without... Obviously, the new players coming through, the younger players in these days, and um, certainly a few things I would have been told or shouted at or said to a coach 15 years ago, you can't say anymore and uh, you can't speak like that to players. And uh, certainly, um, yeah, with my uh, quite broad Welsh accent, sometimes it gets lost in translation anyway, so I can get away with a few things. <laughs> and that's the thing about rugby, isn't it? The rhetoric's changed, or the rhetoric's changed in the world, but in rugby, the game has changed. We now have social media, all these other different things um, that sort of have made the circle less smooth and probably a little bit more bumpy for a lot of people in many ways. Nolly, from your point of view, when you um, hung up your boots, you know, you had coaching experience and you went into coaching and you had a little bit of media experience and then you went into media have you found your niche now do you think because it's a tough transition and I know you've been quite open about the sort of mental struggle of it all yeah I think the biggest thing for me was um finding my confidence in the space that I'm in um I've stepped kind of a step further than most because I've gone really outside of my comfort zone and 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 doing the vast majority of my work in the the men's game and and I think that you know at the moment society is pushing for a lot of change I think challenging situations often allow that to happen and encourage it to happen and um and that means that people are far more accepting to an extent or recognize that they need to be giving more opportunities to different people and from different backgrounds and and actually there needs to be more women in in sport and in you know in rugby across all roles and so you know i've been given a lot of opportunities um that have been amazing and that you know when I look back and I think oh my god like I've been able to commentate on test level game like test matches at Twickenham and been over and done Heineken Champions Cup finals you know it's madness um so early on in my career but I suppose the the challenges with that is I'm thrust as a newbie into that environment and unfortunately like you say Lee everyone now has the ability to provide their opinion. They hide behind the fact that it, they can say, oh, it's just what I think. And they can be as cruel and as vile as they want to because that at the moment is allowed. Now, I don't believe that that should be the case. Um, and actually, as much as people say, you know, just ignore it, they're just trolls, they're, they're just this. It's not just that when you read them because it's personal and it's it's hard to take on board. And I experienced trolling for the first time after a test match that I did. And it was a really difficult space, but I suppose 
for me personally, one thing it did allow was the opportunity to start talking about my anxiety about how I was getting really nervous and and worried and concerned about the job I was doing and having the ability to talk to people that understood made that so much better you know you for instance have been an amazing mentor for me as somebody that has lived through it for years as as one of the you know the few females that have been involved in the in, in rugby for a long time right so I think having the ability to have gone through that and then also come out the back of it um, with speaking to people was something that I also learned when I was a player and I was struggling with an injury around my mental health. I was kind of forced into it a little bit to go and see the psychologist because I was typical athlete. It was like, no, I'm fine. But actually saw the value of seeing a psychologist talking through the troubles I had and then it made me a better player. So actually I've kind of gone through that same process in the media in that I've had some challenges, reached out for some support. People have reached out to me. And then I've now, you know, definitely embracing and enjoying the the chance I'm getting more. Adam, how would you have felt had social media been around um, when you were either starting out rugby or or in the sort of like the the, the midst of your um, career? Because it's a different world now and it is a brutal world. Yeah, I think um, I certainly when I was, I think three or four, well, actually, yeah, three caps into my Welsh career, I was taken off against the All Blacks in Sydney in a um, World Cup game after 30 minutes. You know, I was kind of looking around, you know, wondering if I was injured or not, but it was just a, a tactic Steve Hansen decided to uh, spring on me on the day. So that, that was enough of a shock. But yeah, look, I think I, th- I, th- I had it lucky. You know, I didn't, I wouldn't have had to, I didn't deal with any of the sort of uh, social media stuff. Obviously there wasn't any back then. But I, you know, the, you obviously get a bit in the paper, and it's it was tough for your parents and stuff. But um, I didn't, I wouldn't have had to deal with the same sort of um, for one way or another abuse. So you know, just some, you know, sometimes you, I'm sure you get lovely people saying nice things. But um, and a lot of the, you know, back then a lot of it was very nice. But um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't cope with it particularly well. I think um, it happened to me three, uh, four, four test matches in a row, and um, I got injured in a. Uh, game against Munster on a, a Saturday in the sort of the final weeks in the Six Nations and I got injured and I was glad I was glad I was injured because I knew I'd have to you know if, if I was involved in the next test match I'd you know I knew it would happen again to me and I knew I'd be you know go through the same sort of humiliation of um, trudging off after half hour you know because it was it was a sort of hadn't happened before sort of type of thing but but that, yeah I, I didn't deal with it well I went, you know I went back to my uh, comfort blanket of food and drink and uh, you know I was just happy. I was happy to be injured, really. So I was, uh, didn't have the sort of uh, coping mechanisms I would have had now. But as I said, uh, the players, if it did happen now, would have it uh, a million times worse, you know, on, on different types of platforms. They would have it a million times worse, Adam, in terms of social media. But because of the fact that we are sitting here talking about it, well, everyone really is sitting talking about things out loud that, that might have been um, hidden away over the years. What's it like for the young players coming through? Um, you know, you can talk about it from a Quinn's point of view, but they'll probably always be on their phone, always be looking at social media. But is there a sort of a conversation that has um, through team managers or coaches or anyone at the club to say, maybe just switch it off after a, after a, a big result, a bad result, maybe it, like the one at the weekend, just, you know, st- stay stay out of your head and, and stay off your phone? Yeah, so it's a funny one, isn't it? Um, you know, you obviously you look for the kind of positives and, I was listening to Joe Rogan doing a podcast earlier and he says he never reads the comments and, you know, why would he bother sort of thing, which is, which, you know, which is fine. But if you go back 15 years, players would always say they don't read what the papers say and they don't read what yeah. the, um, what ratings they got, but hundred percent of the pay- players <laughs> all, always read the ratings. So it's kind of like you want to hear that even, you know, obviously if the Welsh journal was giving you a three or something, it's not great, but, but it's not quite the same as when you got some, you know, anonymous person like slagging off. So we, I think we're good. I think the RP is amazing. You know, they do some great stuff, and um, you know, the, our um, play welfare guys, are, you know, they're fantastic as well. So I'm, they spend a lot of time. You know, the academy boys coming through, and you know, it's 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 tough for them. You know, it's, especially someone like I guess Marcus, who's Marcus Smith, who's you know, who's been in the first team since he's sort of eighteen, and you know, he'll get a lot of attention because he's you know, a fantastic player and. You know, but he's in that sort of position where the outside half, where he's like the sort of focal point of the team. So, you know, he's gonna he'll have it worse than most. But you know, he's you know he's a, again he's a level-headed kid. He'll you know 
he's very bright and he's uh, if he doesn't want to read it, he'll just switch it off. So, but it, it is tough for the young players. So it's, it's as I said, I was lucky not to go through it. But in this thing, I can't imagine how you know it will. And everything's very much, you know, it, it's all based around even like WhatsApp groups and all this type of stuff. Everything's based around this type of thing. So it's um, it's t- it's it, it is tough for them. And you know, look, they got off thick skin and it's, and it's something you know they 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 have to learn. But you know, they're the the way we look at it as a sort of organisation. I think the RPA as well. You know, do great things to help with these guys and get a support network and um, coping sort of mechanisms around it. And no, it's interesting because now when you're sitting in commentary, you know, we had a team like Northampton that have. Um, come so close on so many occasions, but they are, are on this losing run of games. Is that in your mind when you're commentating? Because essentially you say what you see, you have an opinion, but you know, you do have a collection of human beings who are probably, you know, a little sore at the moment running around, or do you just have to be pretty tough and, and commentate? I think it's potentially slightly easier because I'm coming from the female game. So I, you know, then although I know some of the guys, they're not my you know ex-teammates, um, which is always a little bit difficult, especially when you're starting out and just kind of building up your experience in that role. I think something that I've always tried to focus on is the technical and tactical side. Um, maybe maybe touch on the mental side, um, the, where the players are at, but from my own experience, because you don't know what they're feeling, you don't know what you're thinking, you're kind of just, you know, s- making suggestions. And, and I think that the worst part is when commentators and the media hammer players and I'm like when it's unnecessary because actually fundamentally we're there to enjoy the game bring the game to life you know tell the story of what's happening and and actually the other side of it is that if I if a player does make a mistake and I didn't point it out then it wouldn't really show my credibility within my role and you know sometimes it does sting as a player when a commentator's pointed something out you're like why do you have to do that um but you can do it in a way that's respectful. And, and actually, I know that having sat in those analysis meetings, we go far harder than any, any analysis in commentary um, because that's the nature of sport. You have to be pretty brutal with the feedback. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't need to be personal. It's professional. Um, it's you as a player, not as a person. I've been in rooms where it has got personal and that's not what the game is about. That's not what rugby is about. That's not the values that we hold. Um, and on the flip side, I've been in, in a room where completely it's been about the players and everybody has taken part in the meeting, felt comfortable to speak up and not that culture of fear and worry to, to highlight a problem because it makes me look like a bad player, you know? So I think, I don't know. I, I'm just trying to enjoy it, enjoy it. Um, and uh, it is difficult, but um, I think one person that does a really good job with it is Hugo Monnier. I think he does a fantastic job when he commentates on Quinns and maybe he's a bit harsher to Quinns because he knows what they can do. Um, and especially to his mate Danny, I think, he, and Chris Asher, I think he gives him a bit of grief. <laughs> Adam, in terms of... Um your transition going into coaching was that always the game plan for you because a lot of players when they reach the end of career particularly when they have been absolutely at the top of their game um they they don't necessarily know what that path is and that brings on a lot of anxiety and stress as well but was coaching always always for you um yeah i think uh well i guess i've always enjoyed it i've always enjoyed coaching and helping uh, the players and stuff with the younger boys younger props I had a good uh, mentor, Andrew Miller, back in Neath for me. But yeah, I think once I kind of got, I knew I was coming towards the end of my career, I thought, um, yeah, I wanted to make another World Cup, but I didn't make that. And it was actually Gats who gave me the idea of going into coaching. So uh, yeah, going into scrum coaching is kind of, you know, it's that type of gig. There's not too many forwards coaches do everything these days. It's usually just a scrum line out, this type of stuff. So I was I was lucky. I was lucky to, um, I'd gone from such a high, really, from, 2013 down to you know getting dropped and deciding to retire in within sort of space of 18 months you know that was didn't quite know what I was doing myself but yeah fortunately for me um I had a phone call off Conor Shea and said wanted me to come up and uh still play but kind of take a mentor role around a couple of the props you know uh, Sinclair and um Will Collier and uh you know I, I wouldn't say a mentored Marla but um you know I, you know, I tried, I tried, and um, <laughs> no, so he's no. We're, I think, I'm, I've been played against Joe. You know, I was, uh, yeah. You know, I was really keen to work with him, and uh, you know, so he's you know, this being, I was lucky. I was a lucky one to get a, a foot in the door, really, and um, you know, see so many players want to coach, but you know, 
don't get the opportunity, you know, I, I count myself incredibly lucky to have it. How good are the clubs and the unions in helping players with that transition? Had you been helped before you got to that stage? I mean, you said that Warren advised you, but he maybe gave you an earlier nudge than you were hoping for by the sounds of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cheers, cheers, Gats. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, I think there's usually used to be the sparking wheels, you'd have a guy knocking about the place, you know, who, but moves more like a guy called Alan Davis, great <laughs> guy who played beneath, um, you know, scrum half, good player uh, back in the sort of late 70s, 80s. He was kind of but more off field. So he helped a lot of boys with businesses and uh, did some great things with him. Uh, since I've been in Queens, you know, he came to work with Queens and we got a guy called Andy Sang and uh, when the sort of off field stuff they want to do and they give you that chance, you know, there's a lot of old boys, you know, whether it's uh, uh, university courses, you know, little businesses, you know, working, you know, working in the city a uh, day a week, this type of thing. So it's... Uh, you know, London's obviously you know, apart from now, but you know it's, it's a great place to sort of get these little um, networking things done. So uh, yeah, I, I, Queens is, a, is it's you know different level to what I've been used to. And Nolly, you've done a lot of mentoring and coaching as well, as you were saying. Um, and I I know because you've talked about it quite a lot, how much you would sort of advocate people to have a, not an exit strategy, because you've got to concentrate on what you're doing at that given moment, but just see the bigger picture. Don't make rugby your identity, your sole identity. And one of the hardest times in my career was actually when we went professional, um, which was bizarre because you'd think it was, you know, oh my God. Um, it's amazing. We were thrust down to Surrey Sports Park and I would see Adam shifting the weights in the gym and, um, and we were in the cupboard room in Starbucks um, at the back with our Team GB set up. And um, I think what was hard was that actually that was only my focus. And I, and I had this glimpse into and an idea for, for three years of, of what it is like um, for young guys and now girls because they have professional contracts now set in stone for the women's game. And it's so easy to get um, completely focused on your sport because everything evolves around the decision making for that. So what you eat, what you do on the weekend, when you go to bed, what you can do, what you what family events you miss, you know, or your training, everything. It is a reasonably selfish existence to an extent, which is a a, neg a negative way of putting it, but actually that ne that needs to be the case because you have to be as good an athlete as a rugby player now um, and your body is your business. But actually one of the most important things is your mind. And something that I've worked on recently is around what is on offer for athletes away from their sport and making sure that it's not just a tick box opportunity. It's actually, it has substance, it has meaning. Um, and a study has been done recently around... Um, athletes that have done things outside, they've had purpose, they've had some level of impact um, in their, their normal lives as a person, um, and then they've been more successful as an athlete because of it. So there is now research that's done for that, um, which is brilliant, and hopefully that can be explained and showed to young athletes coming through because it's for them to realize because you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make, and that's the and that's the problem with with young athletes because they're constantly told more is more and what's the culture within their sport what's the culture within their club and their environment with regards encouraging that support that they should be reaching out for you know to 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 ex to expand their horizons and to look further and beyond um yeah so i i think it's it's great to hear adam saying about the stuff that's going on at quinn's because um, it definitely wasn't the case during my early part of my career, but has something come in and you mentioned about mentors and, and gaps for you, Adam, to set, suggest about coaching Lee, you know, you've stepped in and helped me from a media perspective. And I think that that's what we can all do for each other. Um, you know, the more that we can help each other in this space, the, the better the game will be. No, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Um, have a lovely Christmas, tea or four Christmas, but have a lovely one regardless. <laughs> and I will see you um, for Champions Cup in January. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you for having me and uh, enjoy your Christmas too. You're watching The House of Rugby on Joe. Great to hear from Nolly there, as always. Um, OK, later on, we're going to do our House of Rugby end of year awards. But first, a little bit of news that caught our attention during this week. A group of academics guys um, are one tackling to be banned from school rugby. Uh, experts from Newcastle, Winchester and Oxford Brooks University say that they have potential concerns um, about developing brains of repeated concussion blows and their answer is to take tackling out of school rugby 
Thoughts, Sean? I think it is absolutely madness, um, to be fair. Probably I've a, re- a real bugbearer with this um, in terms of people not knowing the game um, at that level and thinking that the collisions that we're having at professional level is similar uh, or, or in the same context are taking it as kids playing in school, etc. It's not about taking, um, you know, tackling out a game. It's about making sure that coaches are coaching them right techniques and um, to do it in the safest uh, way po- way possible. It's, you know, this this thing of actually taking tackling out of rugby is, that's what rugby is. Rugby is a physical sport. It's tackling as a part of the game. It has been since the game began. You know, you don't see you don't see other sports taking um, moving the cricket ball to a, a softer ball in case someone gets hit with it, or you know, basketball. Or you can't you can't uh, charge at a basket and knock someone over when you're going for a slam dunk or something. You know, all these things are just part parts of the game. It'd be like taking it'd be like taking the the sticks um, out of the GA lads at home in Ireland. You know, giving them some plastic toys to play with and to hit the ball around with. Um, so it's 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 absolutely ridiculous in my eyes anyway. The school rugby is when you learn to tackle it and you learn to build up your skill, you learn to build up the resilience of your body against the tackling. So if you're not tackling until you're 17, 18, you know, where, you know it's like for me, surely the, you, you're going to get more injuries when you have to start tackling when you haven't actually learned to do it, you know, when you when you become live against fully grown men. So this is when you, you know, this is the time to build the skill if you're not good at it. Like Sean said, you, you know, you can work with a coach to become a better tackler. You know, it's like, you know, like a passing, obviously, you know, you get better passing, but, you know, tackling is, you know, it's, it's a fundamental part of the game, isn't it? This, you know, if you can't tackle, they score tries and you lose the game. So, but yeah, it's, it, it doesn't make sense to me. You know, I'm, sh- I'm sure there's scientific reasons that, and w- way over my, you know, my intelligence level, but it, it's just, yeah, it's just a, another one of those sort of um, studies that people do to, um, you know, try to pull our game back down a little bit. You're making a really good point there because every time you're talking about tackling, you're using the word skill. It's a skill to learn. It's a skill. That's the whole point of it. It is a skill. And everyone has skills that they're good at and, and some people are, are less good at, but you work on them and you make them better. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, Adam's hit the nail on the head there about you want to become a better passer the ball, you, you work on that. You want to become a better tackler, you work on that. I think that's where these people are so far removed from the game. They're they're looking at a computer and they're looking at data and whatever else. What what are the numbers in in schools in terms of concussions, etc. In schools rugby, if by an average, I wouldn't say it's very high. First and foremost, um, because physically at that age, at like fifteen, sixteen, you're not running into massive, massive collisions. First and foremost, and you're not like taking the heads off people now with the new rules either. Like if this was if this was twenty years ago, you might have a point of saying because rucking was allowed. Um, you could you know there were seatbelt tackles in back then, hitting heads and necks, and um, all that's changed now. So the the governing bodies have changed the laws to take away contact from the head. It's just a technique issue at the minute that people are actually getting um, the odd the odd belt in the head during games. It's not really tolerated, and teams are so aware of it. We're so aware as players that you cannot touch the neck or head area of any player. And that's why we're working. We, we work on our tackle entry. We work on our on our technique um, nearly every nearly every session to make sure that we're in a good place and that we, we kind of take the referee out of the equation, that we're not hitting anyone high or we're not doing a seatbelt tackle. It's just a bit mad what they're, what they're trying to do, I think, in my opinion. Like for me as well, there was some, you know, there's some, they're doing amazing things around concussion in rugby. You know the doctors on the side of the field. You know they they've got license to pull a player off as soon as they see anything they think could potentially be, you know, concussion related. And obviously, there's a lot of stuff in the news, isn't there, uh, these days? But you know, I'd like to see these guys come to, you know, a junior club. And maybe they have, but come to a junior club. See, you know, three dads coaching their fourteen year old boys. You know how to tackle correctly. And how much sort of time and effort they put in, and it's not you know to make sure that the children are safe when they're tackling, you know. So you know, they, you know, you, you, if you're coaching your kids training, you don't you don't want them to get injured. You don't want to hurt their neck, jaw, bang their head. So you're going to teach them correctly. So you know, I appreciate that there's a lot of it in the news at the moment, and rightly so, is a massive issue. You know, it's a fundamental part of the game, and these you know kids have to learn early doors. 
you know, how to tackle correctly. Otherwise, you know, the injury rate will be when they play against men, when they get to 18, 19, then it's going to be tenfold for me. Sean, cricketers have to wear helmets now. I know you wear a, a scrum cap, but do you think we'll get to the stage um, where all rugby players are, are running around in scrum caps or some sort of head protection? Well, I, I don't think so because... You know, I wore a scrum cap to protect my ears more so than my my head from from getting cauliflower ears. Not that it, not that it, I already have them, but it's uh, it was there to stop them getting worse um, initially. But definitely, it helped me. Um, you know, with with glancing blows and um, you know at the very start of my career. But nowadays, there's probably no, in my opinion, now there's probably very little um, head contact. So there's actually no need really yeah. to to be wearing it and um, because it's policed so well and as Adam said you know the protocols that are in place by clubs now physios doctors is incredible too so you're looked after to the very best it's not like it was 15 or 20 years ago that you could you could be concussed but there was nothing there to measure it or you didn't have a HIA or you didn't have to leave the field and um, that's all there now and it's in place and that's why I think it's a bit ridiculous to come out with a statement saying we we're, we want to take away tackling out of these schools. It's um you know just teaching properly how to tackle. It's a part of the game. If you have to keep doing the tackling session every single day of the week, well do it until you get it right. Um and obviously there's going to be there's going to be times where people get it wrong, and certain people do get head knocks. But that's just that's life, and um, hopefully it's not serious or anything. Obviously, but it's just as Adam said, if you go down to a junior club, um. And uh, you know, see see dads and kids enjoying themselves, and most kids love tackling. Um, and it's about the coaches showing them the right way to do it. So it's it's a part of the enjoyment that they'll take out of the game if they do stop it. Okay, so that's the the heavy bit of the chat. Let's have some festive fun to finish off because we are going to do our House of Rugby end of year awards, guys. Um, let's start off with the try of the year. Adam, what have you got? I have gone. A little bit, um, obviously, patriotic-based. Uh, Justin Tipperick's try against England just after half-time in the Six Nations. That was an outstanding try. Obviously, Sean will know how good a player Tips is. You know, probably might, might, may even say he's as good as him, but um, it was you know, it was a ridiculous try. He's a you know, different sort of, you know, unbelievable athlete and great rugby player. So that would be mine. Sean, try of the year. What's yours? I'd have to agree with Adam, to be honest. I was trying to think. I was trying to think of another one. Um, he's an unbelievable player, skillful. Has I? I always loved him as a rugby player. So I'd, uh, I'd, I'd reiterate what Adam has said. To be honest, fairly straightforward. Very good. Um, match of the year. I mean, there have actually been quite a few, and they all seem to have been in the second half of this year. I, I, I was going to go for Harlequins against Exeter, um, last uh, last season, but because we had a very good scrum performance, but I, I've had to go. I know it's a pretty boring one, but I've had to go when the Argentina beat the All Blacks. I think I, I've had to, I, had, I had to go that so, one. I think that's you know. okay though. Yeah, I know. As much as coat was pretty good. It's a bit good. of a boring one. You know, it was pretty obvious. You know, I could have said Wales Italy recently. It was a good game, but you know, if you put compare, you hear the stories of how the Argentinian players had dealt with COVID. You know, that type of thing, yeah. and uh, they sort of. Um, the media attention they got and to beat the All Blacks is always special. I never did it. Um, I'm sure Sean has. But um, yeah, no, look, it was brilliant. Brilliant uh, brilliant for rugby and brilliant for uh, like, for, for, I was actually, man, I played against Led- Ledesma quite a few times and, you know, he's a great bloke. So um, if anyone deserves it to, to be a coach or be in the All Blacks for, for the first time in the country, then it's him. Sean? Yeah, it's, <laughs> I'd have to. I'm going with. You just copy. You just copy me. Yeah, I'm copying <laughs> you. I'm copying you because it is. It's such a special. I think it's such a special thing, and a special story. And again, when you look back at um, some of the the video footage of the players, um, in their hotels and, and in the hotel first, but at home first and foremost, doing their workouts, um, getting getting doing laps of their garden. Um, it's very special and it's very it, it just shows the commitment that those boys um, had um, to go through all of that and then to come out and beat the All Blacks and they hadn't played a game I did, I, I'm not sure that how many days it was but they hadn't played a test match in does anyone know the actual figures for that they hadn't played a test match in ages anyway a long time out, yeah a long Since time and, to, Cup, and to come out to come out and perform like that against the All Blacks um, was phenomenal and um them, I, I just loved looking at the emotion of the whole lot of it. Before, 
as, at the national anthems and then afterwards as well with Ledesma, um, even Czechs, um, an old coach <laughs> of mine, um, you know, rowing in behind the two. So it's uh, it was it was it was a great uh, story. Yeah, I spoke to Juan Lobe a couple of weeks ago, and he said it was one of the best days that he's ever had, even from being a player, you know, have to be part of that side. It just shows you what it means to them because they'd had some great days together in the World Cups and things like that. A um, moment of the year. Is there a sporting moment, a rugby moment that stands out for you guys? And Until probably a couple of weeks ago, I would have said the way um, the captain spoke to the ref in that scene, in, the, in the Argentinian New Zealand game, you know, um, when he yeah. spoke to the ref around... Uh, you know, he's my teammate. Yeah, the, the, uh, around respect, or you know, you know, he's sticking up for his teammates. So that, you know, that was uh, that's what you want from your captain. Obviously, he's had a bit of a shocker since. But um, <laughs> yeah, the conversation around him has changed slightly. But that, that was like <laughs> from from your captain point of view at the time you know, that game. You know, yeah. that was and you could see the emotion in the game and for that the country. I thought that was um, you know that was pretty. That's what you want from your captain, I think. Not the not the other stuff. Not the other stuff. Sean, is there a moment that stands out for you in rugby this year, or even for yourself? I think I think there's been a few. To be fair, I think with with everything that's happened with COVID and um, the whole year the way it's gone, just getting back playing, I think, has been pretty special for a lot of a lot of people as players. And now, definitely for me, you you kind of you underappreciate um, how lucky we are at times um, to be in this position and to have a job and um, to do what we love doing, uh, whether it be coaching or playing. And, you know, it's been a very bad year for a lot of people in terms of, um, you know, losing their jobs and, uh, you know, just a lot of change. So I think I think the whole year has been just had its special moments. Um, playing my first 80, I think, in two years was was a special one for me, to be fair, even though I pulled my calf during it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> personally, well, that you didn't know that one. at the time, did you? No, I didn't, afterwards, I didn't. So that yeah, was fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. Hard as nails, isn't he? Hard as nails. <laughs> Hard as nails. Um, team of the year, Adam. I, I, I'm gonna have to. Go, I think I'll go Premiership. You, you got to go extra. You know, it's um, it's an unbelievable story. It's um, you know, ten years ago getting promoted, and now they're the best team in Europe, and you know, Premiership champions. But it's such. It's it's just it's the machine. It's just you know, I've coached down there in the A League on a Monday night, and it's it's exactly the same as when you play the first team. It's just the whole like mindset, the whole culture down there is like it's it's phenomenal, and uh, that's what I guess what a lot of teams strive to be like. And unbelievable team, you know, don't um, they what they do? They do everything, you know, unbelievably well. They do a couple of things exceptionally well, but you know, they you know they're uh, you know some team, and hopefully they can carry on. You know, Try to defend the title in the well, certainly the European competition. Yeah, and still such a lot of homegrown talent as well, which is great to see. Um, Sean, would you agree with that, or do you have? A- I hundred percent agree with that. You'd have to, you couldn't give it to anyone else. I think you know they're ten or eleven years building what they have now, um, and so everything, as Adam says, there the culture, their financial um, situation as well. I think they're one of the only clubs that have a really good structure in terms of that, and uh, and the actual running of the club. So what they've built there has been pretty special and they've built it with a lot of people who have been in Exeter for a long time. Um, you look at Rob Baxter and, you know, what he's been through first and foremost as a player and then um, now as a coach. So, um, you know, credit where credit's due. They've been unbelievable. And to, it's never easy to to back up and to do doubles, um, you know, and they've done it pretty well. So does that lead on to coach of the year then for you guys or...? Someone else? Oh, I, I had Baxter, yeah, Rob Baxter. I think um, obviously DOR down there, but you know he's got a great group of coaches. Yeah. Um, you know Heifer and um, what the, what's the I can't remember the forwards coach name now. I apologize. What's his name? Rob Hunter. Rob Hunter. Chris, sorry. And uh, Salvi and you know um, Ricky Perro, These guys down there, you know, they've been there a long time themselves, and they you know they know the culture. And, but I, I we had a player with the Ospreys, Joe Beerman. Was a good number eight, and he used to play for the Cornish Pirates. And he used to say he used to hate playing against Rob Baxter when Rob Baxter was playing for Exeter, sort of 15, 20 years ago. He said he was, you know, tough and compromising. And, uh, you know, you, you don't see him smile much on the TV, but, you know, uh, certainly towards the end of last season, he was smiling a bit more. And, but, you know, he's done a phenomenal job down there. And, uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll, give, I'll definitely give uh, Mario Ledesma a um, honorable mention as well, though, okay. what he's done. I have I have someone different. I've actually um, one of the um, Quinn's coaches, Adam Jones. Um, I'm going to give it to him. 
Well, thank you, John. Yeah. Very kind. Thank you. Yes. There's, there's, their scrum has been, uh, it's turned inside <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> turned upside down loads of times. Yeah, well. Uh. <laughs> But, um, Moving on, breakthrough no. player of the year, Sean. Who have you got for breakthrough player of the year? That he's Irish. No, he's well. He he hadn't got the chance probably, but I'm probably going to go for a Welshman here. Really? Go on. Yeah, uh, Rhys um, Zamet, isn't oh, it? Lewis Lewis Zamet. Lewis Rhys Zamet. Yeah, I think I think just with his uh, club form and and getting into that setup and um I think the best is yet to come from him. He's a very exciting player. Um and um if to get the ball into his hands, um, you know, he'll do a bit of damage in, in the years to come, I think. I've gone a little bit left field. Uh he's been around a while, but for how he's come back from, you know, not playing rugby for a long time and come back to start in Lucia Prop for Scotland, you know, probably in a lot of people's um Lion squads, uh, Rory Sutherland, I think, um, tough boy, you know, he's done, you know, fantastically well to, as I said, come back from some, you know, a lot of time out through rugby. So, yeah, and three come years back, of, basically. Yeah, and, and to come back to the form he has and, um, you know, it's obviously been a prop, I've got, got a soft spot for him. So, I'll, I'll again, been around, been around a long time, but, you know, he'd be my breakthrough player just for the way he's, you know, he's held the Scottish scrum up really this year. And just to finish it off, your player of the year, Adam. Um, I'm going to go for the little French scrum half. Du- I can't Dupont. say it's uh, Dupont. Dupont. Antoine but Dupont. Antoine, Antoine Dupont. Dupont. Oh, brilliant. Like, again, a, a classic French nine. T- a little duck of a guy, you know, but probably got a little bit more rugby than them, you know, a bit more speed than like your Mignonis and your, um, these are the, the boys from the years gone by. But, um, what a, you know, what a player! Unbelievable. He, he just I watched him play a few times to to lose, and just thought, like he he's on a different level, you know. And um, he's one of those French kids coming through the twenty system, and then you know the, a lot of them coming through the same time now. But so if he keeps on this rate of how he's going, you know, he's gonna come World Cup time. It's gonna be it's gonna be the Dupont show. I, well, Sean, who have you got? Yeah, he's he's definitely one of them. But um, I have actually. There's a toss up between two two locks, and uh, probably Maro Atoje for me and James Ryan for Ireland have been my two standout players for both their teams. To be fair, um, Atoje has been immense every single time he's put on a, a rugby jersey in the last year. So he's been phenomenal, and James Ryan as well. And the both of them have been way ahead of uh, of anyone else in that department. So. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm going with a split decision here. Um but the two of them are incredible rugby players and I think they'll be the the Lions um starting test second rowers. Oh so you so you're sitting on the fence? No, I'm not I'm not yeah, you're sitting on, you're sitting, you know, that's not a yeah. split decision. You're sitting on the fence, you would not willing to put your <laughs> I'm going I'm going I'm sitting on the fence, yeah. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. They're, they're, they're level. That's, that's, they're that's, level. Fine. that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's okay. We're calling this the awards. It's not like they're going to have to share a trophy because nobody <laughs> receives anything apart from your praise, which is more than enough, I think. Um, somebody who, well, someone else who wanted to appear on the podcast was Alex Good. Now he is obviously out in Japan. Um, I'm not sure if Japan is ready for Alex or Alex is ready for Japan. But anyway, he sent us a message. Merry Christmas, everyone. I'm sorry to hear the difficult situation in the UK, so I'm sending you all my best wishes. Christmas over in Japan is pretty different. Instead of uh, Christmas turkey on Christmas Day, we get KFC. Apparently that's pretty normal, so maybe I'll bring that back to the UK. On another note, we did Secret Santa this week as a team. Again, that was quite different. Um, Instead of being told sort of price range for the gift, we were told no insects and no live animals. Obviously been a few issues over the years uh, and things came to a head two years ago when another player bought a python for someone. Yeah, that escalated pretty quick. Anyways, um, Christmas Day I will be training because Boxing Day I play Big Nose George Crew in a pre-season game. But I will also get a chance to have a little bit of food and some Christmas time fun with these wonderful people don't they look so chuffed about it? One might say I've overstayed my welcome. But 
maybe I can get him into the Christmas spirit just a little bit, hey? Merry Christmas, you filthy animals. Yeah, those people in the background uh, looked like they were loving having Alex in their house. If you've been listening to this as a podcast, I do implore you to go onto the House of Rugby YouTube channel and try and find that clip because it is certainly worth seeing. Gents, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Have a lovely, even if it's slightly locked down Christmas, and best of luck for your games at the weekend. Thanks to you at home for watching, for listening. We will be back in the new year. Let's hope 2021 is much better. At the very least, it's a Lions year and we can look forward to that. Bye-bye. You've been watching The House of Rugby Season 3 on Joe.